of speakers. Uh, so Ilse Yonkers is a professor and head of the Human Movement Biomechanics Research Group in the Department of Movement Sciences at KU Leuven in Belgium. She's known for her work developing subject-specific musculoskeletal models with a high level of anatomical detail. She's applied this approach to study uh, musculoskeletal loading during gait in children with CP uh, and joint loading uh, during degenerative uh, joint disease. And then our second speaker is Friedel de Groot. She's an assistant professor in the Human Movement Biomechanics Research Group, uh, also in the Department of Movement Sciences at KU Leuven. Uh, she uses a blended computational and experimental approach to study the interaction between motor control and musculoskeletal dynamics in healthy and pathological movement. Uh, her long-term aim is to develop uh, predictive simulations of human motion that are accurate and numerically efficient so they could use, uh, be used to design training and treatment programs. Uh, Friedel and Ilsa are both OpenSIM fellows uh, and active contributors to the OpenSIM com community, so we're excited to have them join us today as webinar presenters. Uh, with that, I'll let you uh, guys take it away. Thank you very much, Jen. So cerebral palsy, often abbreviated to CP, is the most common motor disability in childhood. It is caused by oxygen deficits to the developing brain prior to, during, or shortly after birth. It results in a brain lesion that will become obvious during the development of the child. Cerebral palsy results in a plethora of dysfunction and impairments, of which inability to selectively control the muscles resulting in ambulatory dysfunction is only one. Here, you see a CB child that presents a typically flexed posture of the ankle, knees, and hips. This gait pattern is energetically inefficient due to the excessive muscle forces and it will, in the end, in combination with pain, hamper the child's capacity for independent ambulation. Children with CP receive intensive physical therapy throughout their childhood, but many of them ultimately face major surgery. As this typically involves correction of multiple soft tissues as well as bones, the decision-making is done with care by a multidisciplinary team also accounting for the motor control deficit for the, of the individual child. Nowadays, the clinical decision-making is based on clinical exam and gait analysis, often complemented with medical imaging. Although some common treatment decisions are typically made, the individual operative plan is tailored as much as possible to the neuromotor deficits of the individual patients. Here you see the list of treatments that were conducted to normalize the gait pattern of the child you saw in the previous video. However, to date, surgery is still unsuccessful in four out of four, uh, one out of four patients requiring early intervention at an older age. This indicates that there is room for an integrated platform to support the multidisciplinary teams in their decision-making process. This is the reason why we developed the SIMCT platform. By combining information from gait analysis, PMG, clinical exam, and MRI, we want to provide the surgeon with a simulation-based preoperative assessment of the functional outcome of a proposed surgical treatment. This allows the surgeon to make an informed decision on the treatment that would maximize the patient's functional outcome in this case, his ability to maintain independent ambulation. I will now present to you the workflow that we designed and that is currently implemented. In the second part of the presentation, Fido will take over and she will present some of the new developments that we are currently integrating in the workflow. The prediction of the post-operative gait performance needs to account for the motor control as well as musculoskeletal deficits of the child with CP. Therefore, we tailored the prediction platform to account for the musculoskeletal deformities, the altered muscular tendon properties, and the presence of spasticity, as well as the non-selective muscle control. By combining this information, we can then evaluate the capability gap that reflects the treatment outcome of a virtual surgery. 
ongoing work aims to also predict the post in intervention gait pattern, but this will be further elaborated by Fiedel later in the presentation. So let's first consider the capability gap. We introduce this measure to evaluate the difficulty of the child to attain a normal, typically developing gait pattern. We will present the potential of the simulation platform by presenting a case study. Remember the child that we saw on the video? This 15-year-old male CD child presents independent gait function, and he came to the gait lab with deteriorating gait and pain at the knees. Here, at the right-hand side, you see the kinematics for the hip on top and the knee during gait as measured in the gait lab. You can see excessive flexion of both joints during stance phase, as well as incomplete hip extension prior to toe-off, as well as a limited range of knee flexion during shape. Our preoperative musculoskeletal model describes the patient-specific joint geometry and muscle parts. This geometrical information is obtained from MRI images collected before the treatment using an in-house developed workflow. To model the non-selective control of the CV child, we use the concept of muscle synergies. A muscle synergy describes the coactivation pattern of the lower limb muscles as measured using surface EMG during gait. In black here, you see the process EMG of the major leg muscles. These are decomposed in synergies that summarize the observed coactivations in terms of activation timings and weightings. These describe the neuromotor control deficit of the individual CP child in terms of his muscle coactivation. It is known that children with CP have a reduced number of synergies indicative of the reduced complexity of their motor control. Retrospective analysis of pre- and post-operative EMG patterns done by Lorenzo Pito in our group indicated that the pre-treatment synergies are a good reflection of the motor control of the CP child and that they can be used to describe the post-operative motor control. Indeed, if we look at this graph, we can see that the muscle synergies that were calculated based on the EMG pattern of eight lower limb muscles measured during a preoperative gait analysis were found to still account for over 85% of the variance accounted for in the measured postoperative EMG. Therefore, we concluded that the preoperative synergies can be used to reflect the motor control in the postoperative simulation. However, as the degrees of freedom of the musculoskeletal model are controlled by a higher number of muscles than the age for which EMG was measured, and that were used for the synergy calculation, we use an EMG constraint static optimization to calculate the activations of the other muscles in the model that underlie the patient's preoperative gait pattern. Now, an EMG-driven static optimization is an extended formulation of a static optimization. During the static optimization, we calculate the muscle force distribution so that the moments generated by the muscles for the different degrees of freedom in the model satisfy the external moments as calculated using the inverse dynamics. To this end, information on muscle length and moment arms of the muscles given specific joint kinematics in combination with an underlying hill type model are used to calculate the maximum moment generating capacity of the muscle. A set of muscle activities is then calculated that balance the external joint moments while minimizing the muscle activation squared in the model. In an EMG-driven static optimization, the muscle activations are forced to follow the activation changes observed in the muscles for which experimental EMG is recorded. As a result, muscle activations of the 44 muscles in the model are known. Using this information, 
We then compute the synergy rate factors or co-activation patterns for all muscles in the model based on computer activations. As such, a set of synergies representing the patient-specific preoperative motor control strategy can be defined accounting for the calculated muscle activations of the muscles in the model. To evaluate now the effect of the intervention, we introduce the concept of the capability gap. The capability gap is a measure that reflects the difference between the joint moments a patient requires to generate the desired motion, so in this case, the joint moment needed in the ankle to achieve normal walking, and the joint moment we can generate. This difference is what we call the capability gap. In the static optimization formulation, reserve actuators are introduced as ideal torque generation generators that will be activated as soon as the muscle moment generating capacity is no longer sufficient to satisfy the moment balance. Therefore, the torque produced by the reserve actuators can be interpreted as a capability gap. In our CCP simulation workflow, we calculate the cap capability gap while we account for the subject-specific neuromusculoskeletal model of the patient. First, a medical image-based musculoskeletal model is built for the patient that includes this patient-specific geometry. Using the subject-specific model, a synergy-based static optimization is performed for the kinematics and kinetics of the gait pattern of a typically developing child. The synergy constraint static optimization constrains now the muscle excitation in the solution and is, and is constrained to the patient-specific synergy deferred from the pre-op gait analysis. The torque generated by the reserve activators represents the capability gap of the child, so the moment deficit to achieve the normal gait kinematics and kinetics. Let's introduce the synergy-based, uh, synergy-constrained static optimization a bit more. During a synergy-constrained static optimization, we aim to track the joint moments of a typically developing child, but we constrain the muscle activation to follow the pre-operative patient-specific synergies as expressed in this last equation. More specific, we use preoperative weights and we compute new activation patterns. Furthermore, we will calculate the underlying muscle length and moment arms based on the patient specific preoperative musculoskeletal model to which we now impose the normal walking kinematics. The muscle force distribution, in terms of the uh, activation patterns of the synergies as well as of, the, as of the reserve actuators is then calculated by minimizing the muscle activation spread. In case the static optimization fails to satisfy the moment balance, reserve actuators are engaged and the moment generated by these reserve actuators can therefore be interpreted as a capability gap. Then, we will perform a virtual surgery. The representative for the intervention and a post-operative model is created. Using the pre-op motor control model, the synergy constraint static optimization of the typically developing gate pattern is then rerun, but now using the post-op model. And the difference in the reserve actuators or the capability gap can be evaluated. As such, the effect of different treatment combinations in attaining normal gait kinematics and kinetics can be evaluated. At the moment, these include different muscle transfers, bony derotation and extension of shuttles to the femur, and distalization of the patella. To do this, Lorenzo Pito and our group built a GUI that allows easy manipulation of the musculoskeletal model and the creation of, for instance, extension, osteotomy, muscle transfer, or patella advancements. 
All changes are directly saved to the OSHIM model file and can be directly imported into OpenSIM. Here, you see the effect of the proposed treatment on the capability gap of the child in the case study that we introduced before. So if we focus on the left-hand pane, you see the capability gap for the ankle, knee, and hip extension and flexion, as well as the hip up adduction. It is indicated in these red areas as a function of the gait cycle. So these are the sections in the gait cycle where the child is unable to achieve the typically developing kinetics. Here, reserve actuators are engaged to satisfy the moment balance. On the right-hand side, you see the postal capability gap following the multi-level surgery, and in brief, we see an important reduction of the capability gap at the different joints. This reduced capability gap indicates that intervention will most likely facilitate the patient to achieve the moments required for normal walking. To date, we are evaluating the representativeness of the capability gap in predicting the actual treatment outcome in a prospective study. In the case that we studied before, the intervention indeed normalized the kinematics. We see here in the right hand page that there is an important improvement of the kinematics at the level of the knee, but also at the level of the ankle and the hip, although in these joints no full normalization of the kinematics was achieved. Using the SimCP platform, we can also evaluate the effect of other interventions. For instance, here in the most left pane, we now see the capability gap calculated when a interstrochanteric uh, femoral derotation osteotomy was performed. What we can conclude is that there is an additional decrease in the capability gap, suggesting that the proximal derotation of osteotomy may have additional functional benefits in this child, especially at the hip in the frontal plane, which will dictate the pelvic stability. This effect is a direct consequence of the normalization of the proximal femoral geometry and the consequent effect on the muscle movement arms. Okay, I'm taking over here from Ilse, and I will start with a small recap of what Ilse um, presented. So, we have a workflow for modeling musculoskeletal deficits and non selective muscle control. And we use this workflow to create a pre treatment model of a CT patient. Using our GUI, we then perform virtual surgery on the model. And we use the capability gap to assess case performance. And remember that the capability gap is a deficit in joint moments with respect to the joint moments needed for normal walking. I'll now tell you more about our ongoing development. And I want to acknowledge that what I will present next is to a large extent the work of Antoine Salis. We developed a specificity model that we are currently integrating in our workflow. Specificity affects about 85% of all children with cerebral palsy. And a major treatment goal in these children is to manage spasticity. However, the, mechanic, the mechanisms of spasticity are poorly understood. Our spasticity model is based on data collected during a clinical test. And clinical tests of spasticity assess the resistance of the limb to imposed movement. The modified Ashworth scale is a popular test, and during this test, an examiner rotates the joint at different speeds. For example, in the left figure, the examiner dorsiflexes the ankle, which stretches the gastroc, and in the right figure, the examiner extends the knee, which stretches the hamstring. Spasticity is then evaluated as increased resistance to the imposed joint motion 
as speed increases. But this assessment is often subjective. Uh, therefore, we are using uh, an instrumented version of the assessment. The instrumented assessment of the test, or the instrumented version of the test, allows objective assessment of the resisting joint torque and underlying muscle activity. And here you see examples of recorded muscle EMG during the test. In blue, or in the blue boxes, you see the resting state where there is no joint movement and EMG is low. If you look at the green boxes, you see that there is a strong increase in EMG as the examiner starts to rotate the joint. During the halt phase in, in orange, where joint motion is limited, EMG drops but is still higher than before the stretch. It has been hard to relate the outcome of these clinical tests of specificity to gait variables. Some authors found correlation, whereas others did not. Plasticity is commonly defined as a velocity-dependent increase in tonic stretch reflexes, resulting from hyperexcitability of the stretch reflex. But there is recent evidence from animal experiments that muscle spindles encode force and force weight rather than length and velocity. Therefore, we assessed whether a model based on feedback from force-related variables better explained muscle EMG during passive stretches than a previously proposed model based on feedback from length-related variables. Second, we assessed whether this model can predict reflex muscle activity during walking, as the final goal is to integrate this model in our SimCP workflow to look at stage performance. We performed instrument specificity analysis or assessment and gait analysis in six children. For three children, we performed the analysis pre and post treatment with botulinum toxin injection, and two children had bilateral involvement. Data was processed based on a musculoskeletal model that was scaled to the subject's anthropometry. And in this model, the muscle tendon dynamics was described by hill type muscle activators. The muscle tendon parameters were personalized for the knee activators based on previous work. We tested how well three candidate reflex models describe experimental data. Muscle activation and contraction dynamics relate muscle excitation to muscle tendon force. Muscle states are input to the reflex model. Reflex muscle activity is described by delayed linear feedback from the muscle state and reflex excitation plus muscle tone, this is the baseline muscle activity, or input to the muscle dynamics. We tested three models of reflex dynamics. The first model combined feedback from muscle fiber length and velocity. The second model combined feedback from muscle length, velocity, and acceleration. And the third model combined feedback from muscle force and the first time derivative muscle force, which we call Yank. Feedback gains were estimated by optimizing the fit between muscle excitation and EMG. To this aim, we cut the loop in this model and use the EMG as input to the muscle and reflex models. We solved for gains that minimize the difference between the simulated muscle excitation and the EMG. In the figure, you see EMG in black and estimated muscle activity in color for the three candidate models for either the hamstrings or the gastric. Force-based feedback better explains muscle EMG than length-based feedback. 
we were unable to see the different peaks in the measured EMG with the model based on feedback from length and velocity in blue. Adding acceleration feedback in green improved the fit a little, but only feedback from force and yank in orange could explain the measured EMG pattern. We evaluated the fit over all legs included in the study and we found significantly higher correlations between simulated and experimental muscle activity for the force-based model in orange than for the length-based model in blue and green for the three hamstring and two gastrocnemius muscles in the model. Also, at the bottom, for most muscles, the root mean square error between simulated and experimental muscle activity was smaller for the force-based model in orange than for the length-based model in blue and green. We then evaluated what reflex activity the models predicted during gait by using the measured EMG as input to our model. If the model is valid, the simulated reflex activity should be within the measured EMG envelope. We do not expect a perfect fit since not all muscle activity during walking results from spindle reflex. So in the bottom graph here, you see the measured hamstring EMG in black as a function of the gait cycle and the simulated reflex activity in color. Only the force based model predicts reflex muscle activity that is consistent with hamstring EMG, as you can see in the graph. The force based model predicts large reflex muscle activity at the end of swing, where muscle EMG is high, whereas the other two models predict reflex muscle activity in early swing, where the EMG is low. Similarly, only the force-based model predicted gastrocnemius muscle activity that was consistent with measured EMG during walking. And I will show you two examples. I showed you the fix for the specificity assessment of this first child before. This child landed on its toe and had a large peak in EMG in early stance. This peak in EMG is predicted by the force-based model in orange, whereas the length-based models predict reflex muscle activity during early swing, where muscle EMG is low. The second child landed on its heels and did not have the large peak in EMG at the initial stance. For this, or in this case, none of the models predicted reflex activity that exceeded the measured EMG. We found similar results for all cases. The cross correlation between simulated and measured simulated muscle activity and measured EMG was significantly larger for the force based model in orange than for the length based models in blue and green for all of the muscles. So, in conclusion, we found that a specificity model based on feedback from muscle force explains muscle activity during passive stretches and gait in children with CP. We used the same feedback parameters for passive stretches and gait, which is in agreement with the lack of reflex modulation for patients with specificity. We do not think that all reflex muscle activity during walking is pathological. For instance, reflex hamstring activity in late swing has been reported for healthy subjects as well. However, healthy in healthy subjects, reflexes are suppressed in passive conditions and are modulated throughout the gait cycle. We are currently integrating the specificity model in our workflow to compute the capability gap. The capability gap is a convenient measure of gate performance because it is easy to compute. Running the synergy-based static optimization approach 
only requires less than a minute. In addition, the capability gap has a low sensitivity to the performance criterion that we use in static optimization. We are assessing a torque deficit, and if the model is too weak to walk, it will be so whatever cost function we use in the static optimization approach to compute the capability gap. But on the flip side, the capability gap might be hard to interpret. What does it mean for a child's walking ability to have a root mean square capability gap of 10 newton meters? Using this measure, we do not provide any information on the compensation strategy the child will adopt to deal with this capability gap. Or in other words, we do not predict the post-treatment case kinematics. Therefore, another aim of the SimCP project is to predict the post-intervention gait kinematics. And this requires predictive simulations of walking. And performing predictive simulations of walking is still challenging due to the high computational cost and the lack of numerical models describing motor control of walking. Hence, we have been working hard to find solutions for these challenges. We developed a novel numerical approach for predictive simulations of walking. Here you see the results for healthy walking. This movement was predicted without using experimental data. For those who are less familiar with simulations, let me give you a brief introduction to predicted simulations of walking. Our simulations are based on a musculoskeletal model. And this model is a set of differential and algebraic equations that describe how muscles transform excitations into muscle forces, how these forces are applied to the skeleton system, and how the skeleton moves under the influence of muscle and external forces. In addition, we need to model motor control. And very often, it is assumed that motor control is optimal in some sense, for example, by minimizing muscle effort. But it is possible to also explicitly describe feedback loops that transform sensory information into muscle excitation. Think about the specificity model that I just presented. We can then find the muscle excitation by solving an optimal control problem. This optimal control problem has the following, following form. Minimize the movement-related cost. So for instance, um, metabolic energy consumption subject to muscle and skeleton dynamics and possibly some constraints on the excitation describing known controlled pathways or impairment. And um, solving this uh, optimization problem is hard due to the nonlinear and stiff equations describing muscle and skeleton dynamics. Stiffness reflects that a small change in the control might result in a large change in the space. Or in other words, if I slightly change my muscle excitation at the beginning of the movement, I might end up with a totally different movement pattern. Hence, solving this problem has typically required multiple days of computational time. And this is clearly a huge limitation when you want to use predictive simulations in clinical practice. Imagine, for example, that you want to compare the effect of different treatment options on walking kinematics. It's not very practical if you have to wait multiple days for your simulation. Our approach to obtain good computational efficiency was by combining direct collocation implicit formulation of the dynamics and automatic differentiation. I will not discuss the technical details here, but I'm happy to answer questions later. Since for healthy walking, our first case, we were assuming symmetry, we only had to solve for half a gait cycle, which took us about 50 CPU minutes for the model with 23 degrees of freedom and 92 muscles on a laptop. 
so no supercomputers involved here. The challenge now is to find a performance criterion that reflects human control. The low computation time allowed us to broadly explore the effect of the performance criterion on the predicted kinematics. We found a human-like gate pattern when minimizing a weighted sum of metabolic energy, muscle activity, joint acceleration, and passive uh, torque. When we decreased the weight of metabolic energy, the model adopted the crash gate. And when we, on top of that, increased the weight on muscle activation, the model again walked upright, but the stance width was abnormally large. We will use this framework to explore the effect of neuromusculoskeletal deficits in children with CP. And to this aim, we will perform simulations based on a neuromusculoskeletal model that describes the deficits of the child. And to that aim, we will use the same modeling approach uh, than the one described by Ilse. We made a start uh, by constraining the muscle controls based on synergies. So that is similar to what we did to compute the capability gap. And as a first test, we tracked the motion of the child. So instead of optimizing a performance criterion, we optimized the fit with the measured gait pattern. And this tracking simulation demonstrates that we can indeed reproduce the patient's kinematic based on a limited number of muscle synergies. Hence, this first result supports the validity of our approach to model non-selective motor control. I can not yet show you a fully predictive simulation for a child with CP, but I hope to be able to do so very soon. So, as a small recap, Ilse and I introduced our approach to, to model both motor control and musculoskeletal deficits in CP. We also introduced our GUI to perform virtual surgeries. And further, we explained how we predict gait performance based on two outcome measures, the capability gap and the post-intervention gait pattern. We plan to share the different modeling and simulation tools at the time that we publish our work. Our research was funded by the Flemish government and our project ends in November. And on that occasion, we organized the symposium in Leuven, to which you are all warmly invited. The symposium will be held on November 8 and 9. We and our many team members will present our project results but we also invited other researchers to present their work and to discuss with us. In addition, we will give a hands-on demo of the, of the GUI. So check out the website if you would like to register. And thank you all for joining this webinar. Ilse and I are happy to take questions now. All right, thank you, Frida and Ilsa, for a really interesting talk and get started with the Q&A session. Um, I have a question find the Q&A panel. So um, you should see a little dot, dot, dot to bring up more options, and, and that should list the Q&A panel. Uh, so go ahead and type your questions there. Um, we have one or two questions that have come in already, so I'll go ahead and ask those. So a question from Shang Yi Ye. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so I was wondering, can so they're they're asking if you can talk a little bit more about the relationship between EMT and muscle activation. And I think this came up during the talk about where, during the part of your talk where you were discussing the simulated um, the instrumented test of specificity and and simulating force versus length feedback. Okay, so yeah, we. What do you think? So, that I think it's a, if you can just give some more background about just in general what's the relationship between the EMT measured in an experiment and the activation that you compute from a simulation. Okay, so the EMG that is measured 
is reflect um, basically how much like reflect the excitation of a muscle. So if yeah, if you see higher EMG that is uh, reflecting higher excitation of the mu of the muscle. So um, I, I think so. Like in our in our model, also the excitation is the input to to like muscle dynamics. So in that sense, we think they both reflect the same thing. Um, if we measure EMG, we however only have an idea about like the pattern of muscle excitation. So it tells us something of something about when a muscle is excited more or less, but it does not really give us any information about the uh, about the magnitude of the excitation. And to do that, um, there is there is different approaches to get to an an, an estimation of, of like the magnitude of, of this excitation signal. Uh, but in this case, we um, we we scale the EMG based on what we measured during walking. So we we did the instrumental statistics analysis and gait analysis with the, with the electrodes in the same place. So we looked at the EMG signal during walking and the computed activation during walking, and we we um, matched the amplitude. I, I don't know whether that answers the question. Yeah, well, I guess if there, if you have follow-up questions, please go ahead and type those in. Um, <coughs> the next question is from Anne Colowin. Uh, apologies if I did not pronounce that correctly. Uh, so thank you for sharing this interesting work. Um, she was wondering how the EMG was processed in the experiment where the different feedback models were compared and how it, um, yeah, so how was the data processed? Um, it was a quite typical uh, processing of the data where we um, um, high pass filtered, rectified, and bent pass filtered EMG. I, I don't know the, the frequencies like on the top of my head, but it was a quite conventional uh, processing. Um, yeah, I, I cannot just tell you on top of my head what the, what the um, uh, the filter frequencies were, but it was high cost filters rectified, rectified and then filtered. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, she said that answers her question. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Um, so in the the first part where you were talking about CMCP and predicting the capability gap, you mentioned that you're starting to do some work to validate or determine whether or not um, the approach can predict treatment outcomes in a prospective sense. Um, I know that it sounds like the work is still underway, but can you talk a little bit about what kind of validation you're doing and, and whether um, do you think that the approach will just predict kind of a yes or no, did treatment do well or not, or do you think it will be able to you know, predict at which joint level, you know, it'll improve or not. Um, yeah, so indeed we are still um, validating our uh, approach. I think if we want to show that the approach is valid, we would expect that the children for which we predict that the intervention has the largest effect on the capability gap also would be the children that have the largest improvement in their functional outcomes. So that is what we are currently aiming at. We don't expect to find a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship there, but there should be a, uh, a trend becoming um, obvious. We are trying to do that with um, perspective data sets, so uh, cases that have been uh, collected from the beginning of the project. Um, so that we could also acquire uh, MRI in all of our children. Um, that is not an imaging modality that is used in the clinical workflow at the moment uh, in Belgium. So the data sets we have at the moment are um, spared, 
work to kind of also further support that validation activity. We are also now trying to use more retrospective data in which we don't have all the different components that we need for the modeling workflow. Because we think that it would not uh, be well accepted if we say that clinicians uh, need to um, have always an MRI um, analysis done in these children. So we are also looking at sensitivity analysis to see how much we lose from the predictive um, capability if we do not include the MRI in our assessment. So um, you also asked whether we are looking at a specific joint. Um, well, I think there, given that these children are treated uh, with a multi-level approach, um, we typically will address the different uh, joints uh, at the same uh, time. Of course, the surgeries that we include now are slightly um, biased by the orthopedic uh, practice of our uh, own surgeons here in Leuven. But I think if we look internationally, these represent uh, the most common used combinations of bony and soft tissue surgeries as well as the use of uh, botulinum toxin. Okay, thanks. And will you have a control group of, of some sort? either for, for the prospective work? Um, not really. Um, yeah, yeah, so the only thing is like, we, we can compute a capability gap for healthy children, and then we find that there is no capability gap. <laughs> but that is kind of limited as control, right? I because guess the control showing that, you know, you're using this MC approach leads to better outcomes for kids with CP. Yeah, there, there I think it, it, ethically it's very hard to introduce this in the, in the clinical practice before we have full validation. Mm -hmm. So at the moment we keep the clinical decision making the same as what the surgeon did and they decide on the procedure, but we are now in the process of uh, discussing with the surgeons the cases while we supplement them with the information from our platform and see whether they are, um, yeah, they are accepting the recommendations that we make. We can, of course, not go back and redo the surgery in the same child, so that is an inherent limitation. I mean, we don't want to do that before we have a better validation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so thanks. Um, Next, we have a question from Brecca Gaffney. Uh, can you speak to if and how you are predicting the kinetic adaptations to post-interventions in addition to kinematics? Yes, yeah, so, so basically, if we do the predictive simulations, we, at the same time, have an estimate of, of why the post-treatment kinematics and kinetics. So with the, so, so we feel that that is like an approach that, that takes into account all compensation strategies, whereas the capability gap is, is definitely at the level of the kinetics, but it's all assuming like what do we need to normalize the gait pattern. Um, so our model um, that we use to predict the, the the kinematics, so we, and I didn't tell that explicitly, but we have the contact model. Um, so we have a hand cross leg contact model, so contact spheres at the feet um, that give us an estimate of the um, ground foot interaction forces. And so other than that, there is like the skeleton dynamics, but that is just skeleton dynamics as it is described based on the open sim model uh, in sim body. And then we have the muscle dynamics in there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so next, a question from Misag Mansouri. Uh, thank you, thank you for the very nice presentation. So this question is about the synergy weights that were used for the post-op. Uh, were, were those, um, were the, Sorry, I'm having trouble reading the questions. Were the gains calculated based on the experimental EMG or the simulated activation? 
for they were computed based on the simulated activation but the validation study that we performed based on the retrospective data set that was based on the EMG. Okay. Uh, so next to question from Allison Arnold. Um, can your static optimization approach account for excessive passive muscle forces in children with CP? Um, well, <laughs> we, we think it's not, it's not Great. So our static optimization approach takes into account the passive forces, but of course we will always overestimate them a little bit because we're assuming a rigid tendon. And if you're assuming a rigid tendon, you kind of overestimate the lengthening of the muscle fibers and you overestimate the passive force component that it is in the yeah, of course there is a tuning of the muscle split, uh, the mus muscle tendon parameters included in the workflow as well, and we are currently modifying that approach in order to reflect some of the clinical measures that were taken um, prior to the gait analysis. So um, we are trying to include it more explicitly in the workflow uh, at the moment, but we are aware that using the static optimization, there is part of the role of the tendon and the passive structures on the muscle force generation that we currently do not account for. Okay, thank you. So I think, um, unless anybody uh, gets in a uh, last minute question, we'll go ahead and um, wrap up the webinar. Uh, so I think there are a few um, more slides. Uh, so we went through this part. Uh, we did questions. So thank you, Frida and Ilsa, for a great talk and for answering all the questions. Thank you to the audience um, for engaging and, and asking questions of Ilsa and Frida. Uh, so uh, I want to acknowledge our funding sources. So OpenSIM and this webinar series are supported by several grants from the NIH, including an NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. The next slide. Um, you can learn more about OpenSIM, uh, other upcoming events, and other resources for the OpenSIM community on our website. Uh, and we also ask that you fill out the survey that will appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, this will help us improve the webinar series and choose upcoming topics. Um, so in closing, thank you all for participating, uh, and we hope to see you at another webinar soon. Uh, thank you again, Friedel and Elsa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.